That's, um, yeah, we lost a commission. We need to go get him. It's a ghost town up here. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. We need one more? We need one more. There's Joe right there. There's our sixth one. Okay, item 23. Lori. Commissioners, this is an action item to adopt the 2017 ATP augmentation program for seven of the 10 large MPOs. The seven being brought forward today are Fresno Council of Governments, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, Sacramento Area Council of Governments, San Diego Association of Governments, San Joaquin Council of Governments, Stanislaus Council of Governments, and Tulare County Association of Governments. You have this item as a pink. This augmentation of the 2017 Active Transportation Program was made possible because Senate Bill 1 allocates $100 million in state funds from the road maintenance and rehabilitation account to the Active Transportation Program starting in fiscal year 2017-18. The initial programming capacity for the 2017 ATP augmentation is in the fiscal years 1718 and 1819. However, fiscal years 1920 and 2021, programming capacity became available as previously programmed projects requested advancement in the fiscal years 1718 and 1819. The 2017 ATP augmentation includes $192 million in funding capacity for the three ATP program components. Funding for the 2017 ATP augmentation was made available only to projects programmed in the adopted 2017 Active Transportation Program that can be delivered earlier than currently programmed, projects that applied for funding in the 2017 Active Transportation Program but were not selected for funding. The Commission adopted guidelines and the fund estimate for the 2017 ATP augmentation on June 28, 2017. The Commission adopted the 2017 ATP augmentation statewide and small urban and rural components at the October Commission meeting. The staff recommendations for the MPO component are based on funding levels identified in the 2017 ATP augmentation fund estimate, the MPO recommendations, statutory requirements, and Commission's policies as expressed in the ATP guidelines. Included in the MPO augmentation component are 22 previously awarded projects valued at $38.5 million, advancing some or all of their project phases into fiscal years 1718 and 1819, and 24 new projects valued at $95.8 million, requesting $32 million of active transportation funds. Staff recommendations are consistent with the MPO recommendations with one exception. To balance the programming by the fiscal years, staff requested that San Joaquin COG move one of their projects from 1819 to 1920, and uh, San Joaquin COG um, uh, decided that they could do that, and the agency agreed. So that is the, the one um, deviation from the MPO recommendations. Staff will bring forward the MPO program recommendations for the remaining three large MPOs, Southern California Association of Governments, Kern Council of Governments, and the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency at the January Commission meeting. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the MPO staff, the Commission staff work with on the ATP on an almost daily basis. Many of these people have seen their workloads greatly increase with the passage of SB1, and many of them work on other programs as well as the ATP. But they work tirelessly to improve transportation in the regions. They had to act quickly to get these recommendations to um, commission staff that you see before you today. So I'd like to acknowledge um, them specifically. For Fresno, I'd like to acknowledge Jennifer Solis. For Kern Cog, Peter Smith. At MTC, Carl Anderson and Kenneth Cow. At SACOG, Victoria Cacciatore. At SANDAG, 
Ariana Zorneden and Jenny Russo, at SCAG, Stephen Patchen, at San Juan King Cog, David Ripperta, at Stan Cog, Debbie Trujillo, at Tahoe, Michelle Glickert, Judy Weber, and Morgan Burrell, and to Larry Cag, Gabriel Gutierrez. Sorry. With that, Commission staff recommends uh, your approval of the MPO augmentation as and the pink item before you. Second. Gilmetti with the motion. Second from Tavaloni. Questions? Yeah. I, I just want to thank Lori again publicly. The work she's doing on this and the feedback that we get from folks around the state about how well you interact with each constituency, public, private, NGO, individual citizen has been phenomenal. So thank you again for your leadership on this, Lori. Paul? I want to echo that. Lori, people, whenever I talk to different agencies, rural and in the valley, they go on and on about how helpful you've been. So thank you. It, 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 if I can take 30 seconds too. I, I just want to underscore the importance of all of these programs, and, and I'll just give a personal example. Uh, on my little ride to and from work that I do most days, uh, I hit a pothole recently, which which popped my tire, which means I went down, and you know the hematoma and the blood. You you, you kind of remember that flesh versus concrete. Uh, concrete wins, flesh doesn't. And in so many of our poorest communities, the conditions are even worse. Uh, than what I experience on my 17 mile commute. So uh, this is really where the rubber meets the road, literally. Um, and that work is just vitally important. Lori, thanks again. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, ayes have it. Uh, before we go to item 24, we found an iPhone. Come, come on up. The walk of shame. <laughs> <laughs> it's going for $200, 200. <laughs> okay, item 24. Yes, commissioners, item 24 is the commission's comments on the draft California Transportation Asset Management Plan. So you recall at the October meeting, the department presented its draft plan. Commission staff has comments. We also have a draft letter for the chair's signature. We'd request that the commission approve the transmission of the letter to the department. This is an action item? This is an action item, yes. A motion by Medaffer, second by Inman. Questions? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Item 25. Commissioners, uh, item 25 is an information item. Mark Christoffels, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Alameda County East Construction Authority, uh, is going to give us an up update on their great separation uh, construction projects in the San Gabriel Valley. With that, Mark. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, to borrow a line that came from Commissioner Dunn early, uh, a story that needs to be told. As we know, there is a lot of rhetoric and discussion occurring statewide on SB1 and its merits. The last time the state did a major infrastructure bill was Prop 1B. And the story I'm going to tell you is about what happened to the monies that got generated from Prop 1B. And the reason I said it's a story that needs to be told is it was an immensely successful program and we're here to tell the voters and the constituents here in the state of California that we're ready to repeat that success. First, a little background. Um, who is the Alameda Quarter East? We are a joint powers authority that was formed by 31 cities in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, there's the first miracle that you could get 31 cities to agree to do anything. <laughs> And they have consistently done that for almost 20 years now, because you figure we were first formed in 1998, with the sole purpose of mitigating, and this is an important part, anticipated freight and good movement coming out of the ports of LA and Long Beach. They were back then envisioning the parade of horribles that was going to occur for goods movement that is 
pivotal to the economy of California, but is generally consumed outside of our state. And so these cities banded together that said, we're all for it, but we need to mitigate it. This will put, this map will put it into context. You can see the two ports on the lower left side. There is a large rail project known as the Alameda Corridor that carries the bulk of that freight rail up into the area of downtown Los Angeles to a major rail yard that is operated by the, the, the two major railroads in the area, Union Pacific and BNSF, known as Redondo Junction. From there, they go east. And the BNSF generally heads sort of southeasterly, goes primarily through Orange County. Uh, the red one that you see there is the line zone by Union Pacific Railroad. And the green area is the area encompassed by the 31 cities that formed the JPA that we know as the Alameda Corridor East. This is what they were looking at. So you're looking at a corridor that carries one-fifth of the nation's waterborne container imports and exports. And this is what they were concerned about. As you can see in the left photo, um, delayed traffic, congestion, um, emergency vehicles having to be rerouted, uh, the pollution, of course, that comes from those stalled vehicles. And then on the right is the accidents that were being predicted. You take an arterial with traffic that hits 45,000 vehicles a day, and you run close to 60 to 70 trains across that crossing, you get what I call the driver frustration, I'm going to make this no matter what attitude. If we've all sat through an intersection, and you've inched forward, and you watch that light turn red, and doggone it, you didn't make it, and then you inch forward again, and doggone it, you didn't make it for the second time, what you see is that attitude that I don't care what it takes, I'm not going to sit through another signal. And those motors start making those daredevil moves through that red signal. Well, we're starting to see that with these grade crossings. How often and how long are you going to sit behind a train where you're going to say, doggone it, when there's that opening? Especially in a corridor where as soon as one train goes by, the gates open and then almost immediately the gates start closing again because there's another train coming through the corridor. And then, of course, there's the pedestrian. What vehicles will do, pedestrians will do out of desperation as well. You can see there the projection literally doubling the number of trains that will be coming. This is paramount to the economy of California. We need to have this kind of cargo activity occurring, but we definitely need to mitigate it as well. This is our corridor. Uh, there are 52 crossings wow. that exist within the San Gabriel Valley. <laughs> what we did is Obviously, you're not going to grade separate 52 crossings. Uh, that's costly and, and not an effective use of taxpayer dollars. We went through and evaluated which one of these crossings has high volumes of traffic and therefore would justify a physical separation, and which one of these crossings <laughs> could be enhanced with extra gates and signage and, and warning devices and improve signal timing in the vicinity. We did accomplish that. We went through, and all 52 crossings got some sort of safety improvements. 19 of them rose to the top as being physically needed to be separated. To date, we've separated nine of those. Um, all the ones that are shown with a red star are the ones that have already been completed. The ones in yellow with the yellow arrows are currently under construction, and those in red are in design, destined to go in construction. Now, this is the, gives you, these pictures give you an idea of what we do. We either lower the train, well, you can see in the lower left, or we elevate the train, which you see on the right, or we do a roadway underpass, which you'll see on the left, or we just put in safety improvements. That photo on the lower right is actually what they call a four quadrant gate, four gates. Essentially what that means is the driver can't go around the gate. It locks them out. And we installed a lot of those within our corridor. Now, let's talk about Prop 1B. There was a program called TCIO, Trade Corridor Improvement Fund. And we were recipients of a good chunk of that money. And I wanted you to know what we did with that money. First of all, this is one of the projects that was completed. You'll see that the total cost was 70 million. TCIF provided 33.6 million. And of course, I threw in the jobs and the vehicle hour delay that is now avoided by that. So on a typical day, 40 hours of vehicle idling time was occurring. And that's in present condition. We're not talking about future condition. That is now completely avoided. Here's our largest project. It's a lowering of the railroad. We actually had to lower this one. For those of you that might be California history buffs, this is immediately within, oh, I would say 150 feet of the historic San Gabriel Mission. 
And so we had a sensitivity issue there. We couldn't literally raise the road and have a, a bridge right next to a historic mission. Lowering it was a difficulty because by the time we got the cars back up to where they should be, they were literally in the mission, so that wouldn't have worked either. So what we did is we lowered the railroad in this vicinity. Uh, this trench actually encompasses four crossings in the city of San Gabriel and we'll physically separate them. A side note uh, for you that might be fans of archeological work, uh, being that close to a mission, we spent almost a year and a half just doing uh, sensitive with a whole bunch of, we look like a, a dig in Africa, you guys, with these guys with their sifters and removing almost 5,000 Indian and mission related artifacts that were cataloged and sent to UCLA so we could clear the corridor. The railroad was one of the last undisturbed areas near the mission because the railroads almost came in shortly after the missions were created. And so it was rather unique territory for all of us. Uh, this is another one, Puente Underpass. Uh, you can see again, and that last project in this one will be completed, fully completed next year. So we've been under construction for a while. Again, you can see the TCIF contribution, the number of jobs and the vehicle hour delay. Fairway Drive underpass in the City of Industry, just located north of the 60 freeway, another 71 million in TCIF funds. And you're seeing, a, uh, hopefully you're seeing a trend here while we're leveraging the TCIF funds. You're not paying, the state is not paying for 100% of these project costs. We're using this money to go after other grants to fund the projects. Here's another one called Fullerton Road underpass. Again, uh, a leveraging of TCIF and HRSA dollars in this particular project. And then Durfee Avenue, which is a project that will go into construction uh, early next year and be completed in 2021. Now here's an interesting graph. Here you can see visibly how the funds were leveraged. So you can see where local dollars, uh, self-help county dollars, measure R in particular, were added to these projects. You can see uh, betterment, city, county, railroad contributions, and then of course the state. Um, and then, interesting enough, notice the federal portion is 15%. A little bit of history for you. When we first started in the early 2000s, almost 90% of our funding was coming from the states. Uh, to be honest with you, they were earmarks. Um, but, but they were justified, because obviously what we were dealing with is national trade traffic, and there is a reason that the federal government should step in and support the mitigations required to maintain that. As we all know, that kind of disappeared, and so did many of the federal grants. And slowly, that percentage has dropped. Um, we are hoping with the new infra grants, which we've applied for, and promises made by the current administration, maybe, that we'll see some more federal infrastructure dollars coming into the program. I, I want to emphasize, uh, this has been an immense successful partnership. Right there, it tells you, uh, leveraging out a dollar seventy-sevens for every dollar on the projects that I highlighted here this afternoon in TCIF funds. So we were literally almost doubling that amount. Um, these projects couldn't happen without the cooperation. Obviously, Union Pacific Railroad, it's their facility. They need to continue to operate it. Uh, we build these projects while the trains are running. So we, we have to work with them. I want to reach out to Susan and her staff, the CTC staff, and of course, Caltrans, Carrie Bowen, which is in the audience from District 7. All of these parties work collaboratively to deliver these projects. Just a footnote, because of that collaboration, um, if you notice in the other graph, we have almost $1.7 billion worth of construction work. We have a staff of 23. Now you tell Californians that we can deliver $1.7 billion in infrastructure and we're going to do it with a staff of 23 people successfully, on time, on budget. It doesn't happen without the cooperation of the agencies I just highlighted. The other thing we did in working with the CTC staff is we made Project Shelf Ready. We knew when we received bids that we were going to get savings under this TCI program. The idea is to keep that money moving. So what we did is immediately we'd come back to the commission and say, we've got $30 million in savings because of what we got bids. Immediately rolled it into another project and put that project out into the street. So we kept that money moving. We were assuring the voters that that money wasn't sitting die as we were paying interest on a bond without seeing construction occurring. And namely, I wanted to point out what we did. Um, we, we, we committed to something when Proposition 1B was put forth, and we delivered. We delivered what, in our case, mitigating the impacts of goods movement to the local communities, uh, improving traffic safety, as I highlighted, and enhancing goods movement, which is vitally important to the economy of Southern and, and California in general. And then my final note, looking forward, 
We did what we said we were going to do. Um, ACE still needs about another $75 million to complete that large program I highlighted. We believe SB1 is the means to do that. We've committed to delivering these projects in a timely manner, and I think more importantly, we've proved we can do that. Not just us, but all the other agencies that got funding under TCIF. I'm highlighting what ACE did, but there are many, many agencies out there that delivered similar projects. And so we're here to tell you this is a story that needs to be told. It needs to be told often. Just let us deliver the projects as we've been promised. And with that, I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you. You're welcome. Good story. Item 26. Yes, commissioners. <clears throat> Item 26 is a continuation of your series on uh, innovations in transportation. Under this one, under item 26, we will have the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge implosions. We have the Tallbridge program, uh, Tall program retrofit program's chief engineer, Brian Maroney, who will give a presentation on the successful implosions. Brian, it's all yours. Thank you, Stephen. Commissioners, while, uh, uh, and uh, directors, and Mr. Secretary and all the good folks that are here today. Um, it's a real honor to be here on behalf of uh, my team. Um, I wish they could all be here, but uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to uh, present them well. Okay, good, we, got the uh, we have the uh, file up and running. What I'd like to do is um, share with you about one example of innovation on the east spans of the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. I could talk for four hours about it. Many of you already know that. And I've already been told I can't do that. Um, but I do have a couple of videos. <laughs> I do have a couple of videos for you and I have a few slides. So what I want to do is I want to tell you the tale of how this innovation took place and then show you in the video uh, of what it looks like uh, from up above and, and from very close to where I was. Okay, so um, let's make sure this works. Okay, very good. Well, this is how it all started. 1989, Loma Prieta earthquake. So there was a, an event that was, that was heartbreaking. Um, I actually spent days down at uh, Cyprus. Uh, I ended up uh, basically at every bridge uh, in Northern California because I ended up having to take uh, the chair of the um, Governor's Board of Inquiry around after I was released from the work I was doing at Cyprus. Um, this was unacceptable and it started a huge statewide effort. Once we got into looking at these bridges and everybody at that time thought earthquake damage was really for bridges that were poorly constructed, uh, halfway constructed or very, very, very old. The understanding, that understanding was very wrong. Okay, and when we started looking into the Bay Area, we started finding, here are the bad guys. 200, more than 220 major faults in the state of California. And just in uh, Northern California, uh, San Andreas, Hayward, USGS recently released statistics. In the next, um, the next 30 years, there's a 70% chance of a uh, magnitude seven uh, event to occur in the Bay Area. So this, this, these are the bad guys, okay? Uh, these are two reports. The one on the left side is competing against time. This is the Governor's Board of Inquiry report. And uh, then uh, the Governor also followed that up with an executive directive. I use that as the Bible for seismic retrofit. I've worked up and down the state of California on this. I always go back to that, um, that document. Um, the next document, the one on the right side, the continuing challenge, and there were a few slides uh, added today, uh, some good, good ideas. So yeah, some of these slides you won't, uh, you won't have. The one on the right, continuing challenge, and this is where the innovation started. This is the report the Seismic Advisory Board wrote on the Northridge earthquake. In that report, Caltrans was given good grades on the work we were doing up and down the state of California. But I'll be frank, they ripped us a new one on the toll bridges. They said in that report, out of all the, all the bridges, some 24,000 transportation structures, some of them local, some of them state. Okay. We were not moving at all on these toll bridges, and it's because they were big. They were difficult to deal with. There was, there was not, the technology didn't exist to really address these. So we basically, when, when we heard this, we instantly were about three years behind right off the bat. Okay, so this is where the innovation started. It was at that time, Director James Van Lobensels, uh, Director Harry Yahada in District 4, and Jim Roberts, and I was in the room, they were furious about that report. They were pounding on the table. I remember Jim Van Lovensel's glasses going across the table. He was furious. 
He basically, those three, started what was called the Toll Bridge Program. So they pulled people out of Caltrans all over the state. I just was lucky enough to be one of them. And we were told, don't do it the normal way. That's not good enough. You need to get outside of the box and be innovative. That's an important message I want to share with you, because if you don't have support from the very top, then you get locked into the rules. Caltrans is really good at vanilla. We can take 22-year-old kids fresh out of college and say, here's 22 manuals. You follow those manuals and you'll be just fine for overcrossings and connector ramps. But as soon as you get into something unusual that's not vanilla, and you apply the standard solutions to a non-standard problem, you have the wrong answers. Right? So you have to be innovative on these unusual jobs. And it's not always just bridges. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, the Northern California toll bridges are basically these that are shown on this image. Golden Gate is not part of it. They're still working on their retrofit. Um, they're having some trouble with some dollars, but they're still, uh, they're still working on it. But the others are, they're done. People are on safe uh, structures seismically, and we're excited about that. Sunday night, I sat down, and I thought, OK, I'm going to write down a list of the uh, um, innovative uh, things that I think we've done. OK, I generated three sheets of this. I just included one, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them. <laughs> I want to. I'm really struggling. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight one. Down in the bottom left, the caged fish study. I got to tell you this. There, there's a, a, a group, a committee, that kind of controls um, how much you can bother fish in the water. And there's a threshold level of 206 dBs, sound levels. And the rules are, if you go above that sound level, you're taking fish. And that just crushes projects. Just crushes them in time, money, and sometimes even if you can do them. Well, I didn't believe it. <laughs> and Director Doggerty and my boss allowed me to purchase 1,500 juvenile Chinook salmon from a salmon farm and basically put them in the water in harm's way. And then I was allowed to hire a veterinarian from UC Davis, California's best veterinarian school, and a fish pathologist from UC Davis. And then they dissected over 1,000 fish looking for barotrauma. Guess what they found out? Not, not, no evidence of one fish in, with barotrauma. Okay. Now, we did kill some dragging them through the net, but the fish pathologist and the uh, veterinarian, uh, well, you know, it's, it's hard to move around that many little fish in cages. Um, so that was, a, that was, to me, that was, that was like one of the coolest things ever, because when we don't know exactly what um, to expect on a bridge structure, we'll build one in the laboratory and break it. Okay. So that's where that idea came from. Okay. So there's all kinds of cross-pollination. Uh, this is a slide that I think, actually, Mr. McElhaney and I worked on about 10 years ago. And parts of it were in the Chronicle. And I think we stayed up all night long making sure the Chronicle had everything right. And I think they did get it right. But the entire new bridge is full of all kinds of innovation. If I dive into it, I'll never stop. So I'll just leave that in your package for you to enjoy or look at it. OK, my staff sometimes gets a kick out of the strange things that I like to say. Um, and the word innovation sometimes drives me nuts. And someone I won't mention uh, once told me, <laughs> someone puts the, the no in innovation. Well, I immediately started saying, no, it's, it's in yes ovation. And I drive this in my staff meeting all the time. But there's a true element to it. This is a Venn diagram, and I call it the in yes ovation. Uh, Chris Traina calls it, well, never mind, uh, he calls it something else. But there are three things that have to happen. Up at the top right, you have to have knowledge. You've got to have people that have knowledge. And it's not only from a PhD at a university. I have learned so much from carpenter foreman. I have learned so much from iron worker foreman. I have learned things from laborers. People like Jim Carter owns his own construction company, incredibly um, you know, successful, worked his way up from a laborer. I heard the whole story from his wife um, one, one time when I met her. Uh, unbelievable. So that knowledge can come from lots of places, and you need to have your ears open, because a good idea can come from anybody. Okay? Then down at the bottom, the circle of work. Innovation is not the easy way. Innovation doesn't usually happen 9 to 5 on Monday through Friday. It regularly happens at a coffee shop at 12 o'clock when a problem is facing somebody. And like the story I heard, you, went, <laughs> you and your staff went back to work. That's where the stuff really gets done. And you're also not bothered by the phone and everybody else coming in with whatever problem is new that day. You really have concentration dreaming time. But it takes work. It, it, takes, you, you, it doesn't just accidentally happen. And then over on the left side, supportive environment. Okay? 
And to me, like for example, on, on the implosion that you're about to see, Mr. McElhaney, my supervisor right now, he literally just said, Brian, do what you can, you know, good luck. And just let me, my grandfather used to say, let the horses run. Um, Director um, um, Doggerty and actually Secretary Kelly both came down several times. Um, actually, a couple times, I think they were checking were they confident that this was going to work? And I can also tell you there were other people, like the Coast Guard and the CHP. They really grilled us. Um, but when these things all come together, that's where you get innovation. And it's not always about money. So a lot of people are driven by, I'm going to be a millionaire. And that's what drives them. But it also can be purpose. And that's where things like Loma Prieta or things like that, it gives professionals at all levels purpose. And that gives you the drive. Okay. Okay. A lot of this innovation that I'm going to share with you was completely driven by environmental constraints, rules that different agencies have that they lay out for me, and then I've got to find a path through them. And it's a gauntlet. Um, and you don't want to push back too hard because it, then it's just going to turn into a fight. You want to listen, and that's important. When you're trying to communicate, when I go to agencies, I end up usually listening more because if I understand what they're really concerned about, then I can go back and have the pizza at night or coffee at night and, and come up with some solutions with, uh, with, with my personal team. So a lot of this was really driven by environmental. Okay, the first one, and I'll go very quickly here, was the cantilever. Um, this, is, uh, this is the cantilever that used to be in the old East spans, uh, a 1,400 foot long center span. The center span was so long that the back columns were actually in tension. <laughs> columns are usually in compression, but the center span was so big, like a piece of two by four on two sawhorses, the middle goes down and the ends pop up. Well, this bridge was so long that the back columns are actually in tension, which actually was one of the real challenges here. Well, um, Stefan Galvez comes, comes to me and says, Brian, we can't put any piles in the water to take this thing down. And which is like, are, are you sure? Are you crazy? Um, and I said, that's going to make it a lot harder. Are you sure? And, and he said the environmental resources needed it. So what we did is we came up with the idea of basically taking the deck off in the middle, putting weight in the back spans, and turning it into two diving boards. And I, I want to highlight the day, it, the, literally two days before, uh, before it was cut, um, Director Steve Heminger called me up and said, Brian, are you sure? <laughs> And I told him, tell you what, I'll be out there next to the 200-ton crane on the very end when it, uh, uh, when it breaks. But I can share with you, this was the most challenging engineering on the entire bridge, new or old. And it was just absolutely fascinating because the steel was 90 years old, so it was cracked, it was fatigued, it was corroded, and you don't want to retrofit a bridge to take it down. So there's some of the most fascinating engineering work, and the contractors that we had were great. Now, I wanted to try to accelerate this. Uh, because we found out the contractor was only going to work on one side when they were taking it down and then move the same crew over. And I went to Director Doggerty. Uh, I said, may I please have $12 million? <laughs> and I remember the lecture, not a dollar. <laughs> but he did allow me to take that money from the 504 contract, which is the next piece of bridge that was going to come out, and use it to accelerate this job. This job got done a year early because they had two crews working, one on both sides. That allowed us to put the next contract out a year earlier. So all of the escalation dollars, basically, that we saved on the 504-288s paid for that cantilever. So Mr. Director did not spend $1. But it also allowed us to start the foundation really fast. So that, that's, that's one piece. Now, talk about the 504s and all these structures. This is a picture that's about 80, 90 years old. This is how the 504s went up many years ago. Now, underneath uh, the bottom, you see many, many towers. Those are temporary. So you saw that 1,400-foot span with not a single pile underneath of it. Well, we didn't have any piles in the 504s, no piles in the 288s as we're taking this old bridge down. And the reason, the reason that was a huge environmental savings was because we didn't have to drive all those piles and harm the fish, uh, deal with the water quality, et cetera. So it was much harder engineering-wise and trickier for the contractor. But because we didn't have all those piles and all that false work, guess what? It ended up saving money. So not only was it good for the environment, it actually also saved us. And then because we worked so well and closely with that contractor, that contract was accelerated um, in one year. And we didn't pay for the acceleration. We worked with the contractor so well, they actually finished a year early. So now we're two years ahead of schedule at this point. 
This is what a 504 looks like just as you're taking it down. Now, over on the left side there, you see a cable going up from the back of the column all the way up around the top. So basically, the clever move here was to take the old bridge column and turn it into a crane. Then cut it and lower it. This is a shot where it's down. This is a, uh, this, these are about 100 feet deep, about 75 feet across, about 500 feet long. And they're, they're balanced on barges. Okay. This is uh, one of the 288s. There were 14 288s out over the water. There were another four on the island. Uh, and 208, when I say 208, that's how, long, that's how long they are in feet. This is a shot of one of them up on their piers. Now, jack system comes in underneath with barges. Now, what's interesting here, this contractor did not bid this work planning this. They were going to actually drive piles. But after about a year, we talked them into switching. And literally, live in the middle of construction, they switched. On the 504-288, they finished a year early because I think of that collaboration. Now, I also want to highlight here, these are two barges with a truss that weighs you know, way over a million pounds. Have you ever stood up in a rowboat? Now, imagine one foot in one rowboat and another foot on another rowboat. <laughs> so there's this balancing act that's going on here. And we had to be watching the weather, a, a lot of tricky uh, engineering, a lot of innovation here. We originally. Um, tried to get the um, contractor to move in this direction by using water tanks and weight and change shift the weight of the barges as the weight of the trusses came down. Uh, the contractor in the end used, uh, used steel, but that's fine. Uh, any way the contractor wishes to do it as long as it works. Contractor was fantastic. That was CEC um, and Silverado. Now let's move into the foundations, which is uh, really you know, the, the heart here. Uh, this is a cross section of Pier E3. This is the deepest foundation on the entire Bay Bridge, east side, west side, all of it. These are basically, um, these are about 250 feet from the top of the, from the of where the steel tower starts going all the way down to the bottom. And there are three of these massive structures. They're buildings. The gray lines are four foot thick reinforced concrete. Um, the white areas are, they're, they're hollow. And about, about 75 feet down is where the mud line starts. So the whole idea here was, is we were going to have to build a coffer dam out in the water, or the contractor, we were going to ask a contractor to build a coffer dam out in the water. And we only found like two coffer dams in the world that were that big. So we were going to be right on the edge um, of, of being able to do this. And it certainly didn't make a lot of sense to me to use a coffer dam. Um, so what we did is we took technology from everybody's seen a building on television, like the nightly news, like in New York or Los Angeles, where they implode a building and it comes down. Well, we took that idea and said, we can do this underwater. And then, by the way, instead of having the contractor go down with the derrick and pick everything up and haul it someplace else, which costs a lot of money, and then you have to dispose of it someplace, can we just have this design to implode on itself and then fall down the hole and entomb it. Then we don't even have to pick it up. And um, <laughs> let's just say you'd be surprised who said absolutely no. But I will say um, two um, resource agencies were incredibly helpful. First one was BCDC, Bay Conservation Development Commission in San Francisco. First time they heard it, they were very interested and very open to it. Uh, Brad McCrae actually went on television, nightly news, to support it. And Steve Heminger of MTC. He was willing to go on television and to describe the support. I actually think without that kind of support, I doubt if this would have ever been allowed. Um, now, the next challenge with this is that when you implode something, it's a huge shockwave through the water that can harm sea mammals, uh, that can harm fish. You can do a lot of, a lot of damage. So um, the idea was, OK, well, let's work with the resource agencies. And they can tell us when the fish are not present listed species are not present. What time of year? So they gave us a window. The next thing is we don't need to have 17,000 pounds of Dynamax Pro Dynamite go off all at once. That's a huge shockwave. What happens if we have, say, six or 700 small charges go off? Milliseconds, say like nine milliseconds apart. So you don't get a huge shockwave, but a smaller shockwave that just lasts longer. So the amplitude is, is not as threatening to the fish, the sea life, uh, et cetera. So that was, that was the second thing that we did. Now, that kind of technology, high in computer controlled things. Everything has to go off, so things like special blasting caps, double, uh, in case you always want to back up, that kind of thing. And then on top of that, we put in a, 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 blast, a blast attenuation system, which I'll show you uh, a little bit later in a video. Okay, those were the three. By the way, they were all successful. I also want to let you know we were not allowed to do this all at once. 
uh, the resource agencies, and I remember one person pointing their finger at me going, just because I let you do one doesn't mean you get to do all of them. So we did the demonstration project. We were allowed to do just E3 to prove it. And then the next year, this is, this is the quote, well, we want to verify that you're good, not just lucky. Can you do four and five? And then those went well. So then last year, we signed a contract to go for the next two years and do all the peers from E6 all the way to E18. Well, once we got out, I asked the contractor, why don't we get this done this year? <laughs> you can go home and you know, take your profit with you and we'll get, you know, I, can't, I, I told him I have no money, <laughs> but we'll all be done a year earlier. Um, and they thought about it for about five months and then went for it. Um, now, I do want to let you know the coffer dams, they are deep and the material went down the hole successfully. Um, but the other piers, the other piers, these are, um, these are piles. So there's no hole, there's no void down there. So we actually had afterwards to, um, to pick them up and haul that material away. Uh, I want to share with you a couple of things that I don't think I've ever seen anybody uh, at Caltrans do anyway. Uh, we had a weekly, um, what we call a cabinet meeting, a weekly meeting where we go over schedule. Everybody's in the room. And the idea for doing that is everybody knows what everybody else is supposed to do. If somebody is off, off page, off direction, that's their chance for everybody else to correct them. So we're all moving down the same, we're all reading off the same sheet of music. And if somebody needs help, that's their time to, uh, to say, I need some help. Plus, it really helps to be able to send this kind of thing up to management because they like to know what's going on. Now, our normal schedules have like 20,000 items. We always reduce it down to one page, 11 by 17. And they were constantly changing all the time. Uh, I basically had a full-time scheduler, and that's all she did. She was fantastic. By the way, she was there at the very beginning. She was there for more than 15 years. I have the best staff in the world. In 15 years, one person quit. Just uh, amazing. Um, I can't say enough about the staff. OK, um, this is what, um, right now, uh, all the, all the piers that are supposed to be taken out are gone. There are this image over on the left. There's Pier E2, which is a, a pier that's near the island. And then there are four piers over on the other side, 19, 20, 21, and 22. They're marine. 23 is not a marine pier. Um, those are being considered uh, this, this, this month by the POC to see if they want to fund um, uh, public, uh, public access to have people be able to walk out into the bay and experience the bay, learn about the bay, uh, and be incorporated into parks on the Oakland side and uh, part of uh, some development on Yerba Buena Island. And quite frankly, I can tell you, I, I think we're done. However, um, with that last blast, oops, there you go. Dan, can we show the video? Can we first show it, the triple? Okay, when we started going around telling people what we had in mind, everybody was going in 12 different directions. So what I did is I had a, a small California company called NorCal, uh, and they put together this video for me, literally just describing in words what we got, what we have in mind. And we would go over there once a week for like an hour after, after dinner. And this guy would basically uh, use technology that was developed um, in part um, on your Bowena Island, BRIM, Bridge Information Management System. And we stumbled across it. And we thought, we can communicate with this to resource agencies rather than using words that, you know, engineering words that not everybody may understand or respect. And we showed this. We showed all the resource agencies and anybody who wanted to know, this is what we're up to. This is what we're going to be doing. Here you see the barges coming in. That's the drill. Many, many holes are drilled. There are various levels of decks of dynamite spaced with spacers, each of them computer controlled. Once that's drilled, contractor comes in, lays down a blast attenuation system. A blast attenuation system, some people call it a bubble curtain. I refuse to accept that. A bubble curtain is something you buy at Toys R Us for 99 cents. A blast attenuation system costs millions of dollars. What it does is it pumps in, if you get 3% air in the water, it's no longer water. Water is incompressible. It's a perfect transmitter of a compression wave, perfect. However, you just put a little bit of air in, just like one bubble in your brake line, now your brake doesn't work, okay? It, it, you attenuate the ability to brake the car. Here, we're knocking down 80% of that shock wave after we've already reduced it by using lots of little small charges, okay? We had lots of, uh, lots of things to be concerned about. PG&E gas line, uh, pressurized PG&E gas line, East Bay mud sewer outfall, and BART. Uh, I was allowed to purchase, thank you, I was allowed to purchase instrumentation 
uh, and put instrumentation on those uh, on those uh, valued assets to the community. And we started collecting information when we were imploding very far away. And as we got closer, I could build attenuation models or mathematical models to predict well um, what the um, uh, what the what the motions would be, um, and the engineers at PG&E, uh, uh, El Paniki, she uh, she's the state she's their state uh, pipeline engineer. She's a fantastically sharp lady, very supportive, liked our numbers, liked the way we approached it. Master Blaster, <laughs> there's all that's where that's where some of you were. <laughs> no, I was standing. I was standing. Uh, that's a long story. <laughs> That's a federally licensed um, uh, um, position, and there's a lot of responsibility. But I had a very well-designed uh, system to feed him information. Uh, this is the blast attenuation system going. We were not allowed to, um, uh, to go forward with the blast unless we were certain all that was working. Here you see the first one going off, and you see the red shock waves traveling. Then the second one goes off, and the green shock waves traveling. It's the same kind of blast, same kind of wave through the same medium, so it has exactly the same speed. National Marine Fisheries did not like this idea. They did not want to do this. So they were afraid of a super wave, these waves combining to have like a super wave. And after spending five minutes talking about fast Fourier transforms and differential equations, and I saw their eyes roll back, I thought, okay, this isn't working. So I just said, what if I just separate it by 500 milliseconds, and I showed them where the math came from, and then they were happy. And of course, we had to verify that we did all this. Okay. Uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board, they wanted us to put the booms in, which I think was a really effective and really good idea. Nice contribution by Regional Water Quality Control Board. Crane comes in. Uh, before we do this, we actually would send in sonar boats to get topography uh, under the surface so we know where the, um, the piles are. And then the derrick would come in, clean it up, and then we'd send the uh, sonar boat back in. Um, because th these are submittals that we have to give back to all the resource agencies. And then we had to demonstrate to the Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Coast Guard that there is no risk to marine navigation. And we also had to verify with the Corps of Engineers that um, there was no disruption to the flow, natural flow of water in and out. And these are also submittals that we have to go back. We have just a host of submittals that we have to go back and prove to, um, prove to the various resource agencies that we did what we promised we would do. We're done. Dan, can you run the next one? Now, this one's really short, and for about $2,000, you can buy a drone now down at Radio Shack. Oh, I guess, guess you can't buy it at Radio Shack anymore. But um, it's, uh, it's amazing what, what you can do. Okay, so this is an actual, notice the sequence. So I wanted this so I could send it back to National Marine Fisheries saying, see, we really did it. We had all kinds of sensors showing this too. Okay, Dan, can we go back to the slides? If anybody wants these uh, uh, videos, I have many of them. You'd be welcome to uh, grab any that you wish. Uh, I do want to let you know this was a research project. To get the resource agencies to buy into this and so many other agencies, again, they let me do one first. We ha it, was a, it was a giant laboratory. I, I built and destroyed abutments uh, at UC Davis for research. Um, and this had more instrumentation than my dissertation did. Uh, we had pressure sensors in the water. We had hydrophones in the water. We had motion sensors at BART, motion sensors. Uh, we practiced on trains. Um, uh, we, we had cage fish studies. This is research that I'll bet you there are going to be 10 people get their PhD, because it's definitely original work, um, and it's a real contribution. And it's, it's going, information from this is going to change jobs that you folks, uh, you folks direct. So um, it, it was. Quite frankly, one of the most exciting things uh, I've ever done. Um, the, we've got two or three slides that uh, we want you to be aware of. Those last five piers, this is what the TBPOC is considering. Uh, this is Pier E2. It's out by Yerba Buena Island. The city of San Francisco owns it, tied to Treasure Island uh, Development Authority. They're developing uh, Yerba Buena Island and Treasure Island. And uh, the POC, it was actually, um, the POC came up with the idea of maybe we should keep these not spend the money to take the pier out and build a walkway out to them. 
So on your Buena Island, uh, this is Pier E2, and the proposal is to have public access so people can ride their bike out on the new bridge and then ride their bike down here or walk down here and walk out and view you know, the architectural statement that the self-anchored suspension bridge is. Over on the other side, uh, the Oakland side, there's already a park planned uh, on the Oakland touchdown side, and there are four piers out in the water that are remaining. So the concept down below is the idea to extend out to two piers and then keep the last two piers for bird habitat. And we've hired an Audubon specialist to, to help guide us in that. Um, and it's, it's pretty effective. There are a lot of stakeholders uh, involved in this. And I won't run through all of them, but um, that's the list. And the last thing we want to do is we want to say thank you um, very, very much for your support. I remember, I don't know if any of you were on the commission then, but we were having trouble with the United States Navy and the city of San Francisco. And the Navy came here and you ripped them a new one. <laughs> and I stood up and applauded while I was uh, listening to that. And I'm never gonna forget that. I think, I think that was a huge, you guys have a really strong uh, reason for, for being proud of what you did, and you were right, because we got it done. Uh, I also wanna say thank you to um, agency. Um, <laughs> I, I, we blew them up and I, I didn't break anything. <laughs> and I also wanna say thank you uh, to, to uh, the CHP. They were incredible. Um, they were j just unbelievable. Uh, I got to figure out how to make sure Officer Vu gets uh, uh, graduate uh, of the year at UC Davis. Mr. McElhaney, I think you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, a absolutely. On behalf of Brian and I, and Malcolm, Bijan, all the Caltrans team involved, all of Caltrans has been following this uh, for many years. We want to thank uh, the chair and the commissioners for their leadership and teamwork. Thank you, Secretary Kelly. Uh, Assemblymember Fraser, Senator Bell, uh, constant communication has really helped us. Uh, the Toll Bridge Program Oversight Committee, which is CTC, MTC, and Caltrans, established in 2005 by great legislation, committed us to share the program oversight. And now that we're coming near to the end, we're all very happy about that. Uh, and we, the race to seismic safety has been important to all of us. Um, also, big thanks to Vince and the Federal Highway team over the years. A great, great partnership. It, it really did take uh, on this demolition project innovation through multiple agency collaboration, working closely with industry. We got a great CMGC contract uh, that we think is uh, going to be award winning for uh, many years to come as we look back on this demolition project. Teamwork, federal, state, regional, resource agencies, all at the table to achieve the work. And also, I, I think on behalf of all of us, a very, very special thanks to Dr. Brian Maroney uh, for his leadership and all of his engineering. Thank you, Brian. Brian's been inspiring us all to, to race to seismic safety, uh, complete this demolition timely. And, and we've saved at least a year and over $10 million on the demolition contracts in big part to his leadership. Thank you, Brian. Any questions, commissioners? Jim. Yeah, Brian, get back up here. <laughs> um, Joe and I have been on this commission uh, 14, 15, 16 years, I forget now. Um, and we've been through all the trials and tribulations of the Bay Bridge. And I just want to congratulate you and your staff for all the innovation you put forward. This was not an easy bridge to build. And uh, it may not have been, in my mind, the right bridge to build, but it's a beautiful structure. And you guys uh, did an admirable job. Unfortunately, um, uh, the bridge uh, did, we did not increase the capacity of, of the Bay Bridge and the traffic out there is, is getting horrendous. And since you're now out of work, I'd like you to think hard <laughs> about a southern, I, I am, I am looking. Yeah, about a southern crossing from the San Francisco airport over to the Oakland airport. And we could put BART on it and get BART to help pay for, for, for the structure. But we, we need to do something for con congestion relief I know we've been talking about that in SB1, and, and certainly uh, we could use another crossing over the bay. I actually was asked to put together an advanced planning study about 12 years ago um, and, and, and did that. And there was one even earlier in the 60s. And I can tell you from that work that I did, it's, it's absolutely doable. Um, connecting the airports, connecting. Um, the challenge is actually not the bridge. The challenge um, are the um, interchanges. On, e on either side, and it's more community environmental. That's the challenge. The bridge part, 
um, it, you know, let's let's choose a, um, a straightforward bridge. <laughs> so um, a straightforward bridge is what I had in mind. Yeah, I'm like why quit now? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but let's use your innovation and your creativity to solve those problems. I still have an easy another ten years left in me, so I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking for something good. Uh, Director Doherty has promised me he's going to find me something good. Thank you. Yeah, just for clarification, he's, we're looking for a place for him within the department. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I just uh, wanted to share something very quickly. I, re I was actually on the bridge uh, in 1989 when they took the last piece off the bridge. And I, wait, I was there for 12 hours trying to get, in my prior life, I, was, I put out a newspaper for the uh, construction unions. And uh, uh, I, I leaned out over the edge, laying down so I could get the perfect shot, and we had an aftershock. The whole bridge started <laughs> to shake. But what really, I mean, that was nothing. But I still, I, I have a picture of it somewhere. That bridge where that last piece was, there was still a chunk of, of uh, iron that was keeping that from actually falling into the bay. And they had to have a, a, an iron worker get up on a ladder, uh, he he had a he had a safety cable of some kind. I don't know what good it would have done, but he was cutting that piece of of uh, metal, and there was a uh, there was a crane operator holding the whole thing, and nobody really knew it once he cut through whether that thing was going to shift and he was going to go flying off or what. And he had this leather jacket on that said Johnny Be Good on the back of it, and I thought that guy has got some backbone and other anatomy that really. No, but, I mean, I don't know why you would do that for a living, but I, it gave me a lot of respect, as I always have after many years, for all the construction workers who work on these jo these jobs. They got to know what they're doing, but they also got to have some guts too. They do, and yeah, I I, I know the kind of maneuver that, that you're talking about, and it is uh, it's it's dangerous. They they uh, they take some risks. I, I do want to share with you. Everybody knows about E9 down. Does everybody know? that there were more than a half a dozen other piers where the superstructure, that is the horizontal part, completely disconnected from the vertical part. And Loma Prieta was half the duration of a typical magnitude seven earthquake. And that's because of the rupture scenario, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's detail. But it lasted half as long as you would normally expect it. And these things were out there sliding around on, on a tabletop. And we could have very easily had half a dozen 300 foot spans in the water, which which there would have been loss, of, there would have been terrible loss of life. I also want to share with you: Does everybody know that one of our goals, right from the beginning on this job, the span, not one construction worker dies, not one death, and we're going to be able to put up a Christmas tree, right? You're not supposed to put the Christmas tree up until it's done. It's a bad omen, but it means nobody lost. And when you think about a job of this size, um, the contractor safety officers. And Caltrans safety officers, they don't work for me, they work for somebody else. They've really done a, a really, get, uh, really great job. Yeah. The, the, the laborers, the iron workers, the carpenters, um, it just, I have tremendous respect. When I teach bridge design at UC Davis, I tell these young people who all want to go and work in a very fancy design office. That's what they all want to do because, you know, they're being brought up in, in a university. And I always tell them if I was 25 again, I'd want to work be an engineer for a contractor mm -hmm. because you can't get any closer and there's a thrill being out doing what you were talking about. But I have such admiration for our contractors um, and, uh, and, and those workers. But I tell those students, remember, you might have a PhD and you might design the wildest bridge in the world, but at the end of the day, who builds the bridge? It's not a bunch of PhDs at a university. It's iron workers, carpenters, operators, uh, it, those people, and it's on their back, and half the time they carry around 60 pound belts. You know, their backs are, are you know, they, they really put their backs into it. I have great admiration for them. We make dreams come true. <laughs> they do. They do. <laughs> Susan? Um, commissioners, since um, receiving this appointment to my position, I'm serving on the Tollbridge Program Oversight Committee, and I've learned so much from. Uh, my fellow TB POC members, also Brian, and there's actually a team that um, of individuals that are attending those committee meetings that could not be here today. And I will tell you that in those committee uh, meetings that we have, 
I have questions that are more in line with you know budget, finance, schedule, and um, there's a lot of patience that this team has afforded me and meeting with me uh, and talking with me. And I just want to say that you see them in a setting like this, like you see Brian here today, uh, going out on the bridge. You know when they are imploding these foundations. I've I've gone out there twice now, and just to watch this team, which you actually can't see the team is amazing and I guess I just wanted the other members that work um, closely with Brian or you know part of the team I just wanted to um, in case they are watching today just to let you know their names um, you know Dan McElhaney and we know Brian but there's also Bill Casey Deanna Vilcek Chris Trina Stefan Galvez Hassan on the tour and Patrick Tracy are the individuals that um, you know come to the POC meetings, provide information to us to make the decisions that we need to make. And what I, I know now, after you know some time on the POC, is that these are people that are out there and actually coordinating these amazing, amazing, once in a lifetime actions that happen that um, are just really incredible. I don't know what else to say, so I just wanted to, to give you that perspective. Um, really. Uh, Brian, you really, you and your team are amazing people. Good job. Chair, if I may, Dan McElhenney, uh, Susan, thank you very much. The team really appreciates that. Malcolm, the two of you on the Oversight Committee has been fantastic with Steve Hemminger. Uh, and Stephen Mahler, Andy from Mayor, thank you for all your work as part of our program management team. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Stephen, information calendar. Yes, Commissioners. The next uh, eight items, 27 through 34, information items deemed by staff not to raise any issues. The individual items will not be presented unless specifically requested by a Commissioner. Hearing no requests, we can move on to the consent calendar. The next 12 items, 35 through 46, are consent calendar items. The following changes need to be announced. <coughs> Under uh, item 40, the resolutions of necessity, resolution C, 21579 for uh, Warnecke, and C, 12583 for Cahill are being withdrawn. Under agenda item 44, Prop 1B amendments, 2.5G, 1B, Lincoln Bypass is also being withdrawn. With these changes, staff recommends that you approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion by Gilmetti, second by Dunn. Questions? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Um, item 47. Yes, commissioners. Item 47 is an airspace lease for SKS Partners. And the city and county of san francisco at the october meeting you approved direct negotiations between caltrans and sks this item now is the approval of the actual lease under the direct negotiation requirements this would require a unanimous approval from you staff recommends that you approve this directly negotiated lease we have a speaker um don't talk yourself out of yes bud Mark Watts to speak. Mr. Chairman, members, on behalf of General Motors and Cruise Automation and the uh, landlord SKS, thank you. Appreciate your support. Okay, there's a motion by Gilmetti. There's a second by Paul. Arp. Paul. Who is it? Paul. Paul. Um, questions? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Item 48. Yes, Commissioners. Item 48 is a new report that we are starting because uh, the Commission now is in charge of allocating the support components for shop projects. Normally before under, when you just did the capitals, we had the capital portion of, of projects, we had what is known as voted but not awarded report. Four months after a project is allocated funds, Caltrans starts reporting on has the project been awarded under the support component four months after a project has been allocated for support components the department is to report if they have started spending against that uh, component so this is the first time we're seeing this report 
and uh, we are Caltrans is, is ready to to go over the different and specific areas of this report where where they have expenditures against design they have expenditures against the environmental phases and the right-of-way support phases so is it Bruce is it you or or Jim, Jim Davis or Jim? will be uh, presenting the item Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Jim Davis, Caltrans Project Management. Um, I'm here to report on the pre-construction phases. Um, back in June, you allocated 1,094 pre-construction phases. Um, after four months, 90% of those have started. At the end of this month, 97% of those uh, allocations will have started. Uh, per, per your request, we implemented uh, the allocation process at the same time that we were developing the guidelines. And so we went through some growing pains and we've had some lessons learned. Uh, the primary one is timing. And what we're trying to do is time our allocation so we have no downtime. So when, and when we go for a right-of-way allocation, we have to determine when is the end of the PAND, Project Approval and Environmental Document. And so we're trying to get that timed up right. And uh, there's some uh, lessons learned that we could do a little bit better job of doing that. So that's uh, the primary uh, challenge that we've had was on the, on the timing. Uh, there's also a couple, uh, my understanding, there's a, a couple questions on PNED where we've asked for a PNED allocation and are not expending. And I want to uh, articulate why that is. There were two projects that kind of fall into that category. One is a project we have a parent project. And what basically, sometimes what we do is we have a parent project for a little bit bigger project, and we'll break it into smaller, what we call children projects. And one of our projects was that way. And we asked for uh, a PNAD allocation for one of the children project, but we actually did the environmental document under the parent. And so it was an error. Um, but, but we actually did that work under another another project or parent project and then it had had an error there the second one was a project where we actually had four projects uh, small projects and we decided to combine them and we asked for one allocation for PNED um, um, and it was the wrong one and we should have asked it for a parent project once again so just a, an anomalies that we ran into and in implementing uh, or asking for requests of allocations of almost 1100 uh, uh, phases and that concludes my report, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Stephen? All right. The next agenda item is item uh, 48, no, 49, which is our ZEV series. Under 49, the department will be reporting on their status of their changes to the program. Originally, when the department presented the program, commission staff and commissioners had lots of questions. The department has revised the program. I think they're moving right in the right direction now. The program makes a lot of sense. And Keith Robinson, who's been in charge of the program, will be making the presentation. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I like that last statement. It makes a lot of sense now. I think it does. <laughs> I'm Keith Robinson. I'm representing the Division of Design at Caltrans, and with me is Albert Cox. He works for me as one of my office chiefs. Uh, we had a presentation to the Commission in August regarding the Zero Emission Vehicle Plan, the program the Department is investing in, and we want to give you an update today. I want to mention that we're focusing on the 30 and 30 plan, which is the Governor's direction to install 30 fast chargers on the state highway system within 30 months. That's November of of next year. So this is the first at phase, the first initiative for the department to get into the uh, zero emission vehicle effort. The department is still working on long range planning efforts to implement in the future. At the previous meeting, the commission had a number of questions regarding the zero emission vehicle effort the department had. It primarily had to do with funding, locations, who were we were consulting with, long-term maintenance and operations. There was a whole gamut of questions. I want to uh, thank the Commissioner Keogh, McNaffer, and Inman for talking to us on Friday of last week. We had a very good, I thought, productive discussion on where we were, and we answered a number of questions that came up during that meeting. Um, we've had a significant collaboration with the California Energy Commission. Uh, other partner in the program, we've located uh, different spots for some of the rest areas and other uh, charger locations based on making a more sensible plan. And we have, uh, you had asked us before if we were going to have a potential to expand the system. We'll get into that in detail a little bit later, but each design for each location will be able to be expanded if there's need and there's usage at that particular site. 
You asked us about utility collaboration and installation and management mechanisms, how we're going to get these contracts out, and if we have potential to work with other agencies to do a more efficient way of getting these projects out, and we've done research in that. You asked us about commercialization potential, whether we are working in disadvantaged communities and what the environmental documentation mechanism was going to be to get these projects through. So I'm really happy to say that we've, we've gone through a significant effort to rethink the program, just to figure out where these projects are going, working in collaboration collaboration with the Energy Commission and Department of General Services, primarily in the governor's office, to make sure we're putting in the right locations at the right time with the right costs. So generally, the Energy Commission fully supports the proposed locations that we're going to be showing you shortly, which fill gaps in priority routes throughout the state of 80 miles or greater. Uh, we will connect prior, and we, the department initiated a plan to connect priority quarters where the Energy Commission did not have connections that they fully support. Um, each site will include one charger with two, two charger hoses, for lack of a better word. Electrical systems are being designed so that we can expand, as I mentioned before, in, for future use if needed. Rest area locations will be free. This is important. Rest area locations will be free to the public because of federal restrictions we cannot charge for usage at those rest areas due to restrictions on commercialization. We estimate that if the chargers at the rest areas are used 24-7, there'll be an annual cost of about $200,000 to the department to providing electricity to the public at those locations. Capital support cost ratios were very important to the commission and to executive staff over the last eight weeks we've been working on this project. And I'm happy to say that the capital support costs have dropped from 75 to 56%. So we've had a significant in, in ability to make these more efficient to deliver and to construct. Who's doing the slides? Is it this here? Okay, thank you. Okay, here we go. So we are working significantly with, we have worked significantly with the Energy Commission. They are, have been, we just met with them two weeks ago to make sure they're on board with where we were headed before the presentation came to you today. Uh, as I mentioned, we are filling DC fast chargers. We are going with smart DC fast chargers so we can collect information from the usage. And we are focusing on 80 miles or greater, the, the distance that some of the older electric vehicles can cover. Uh, we are, as I said, installing one location at 37 sites throughout the state. The governor's requirement was that we put in 30 locations in 30 months. We will get 34 of the 37 started in construction by November of next year, which is a cutoff date. The remaining three will occur in early spring of 2019. And we are committed to using capital and support cost funds most efficiently. The 10 projects will install DC fast chargers at 28 rest areas. These are the locations where we'll be providing uh, connection to the public for no charge. Five will be at maintenance stations, two will be at district offices, and two will be at park and ride lots. All but two of the locations are in disadvantaged or low income designated communities, and we are leveraging programmed projects to utilize DGS purchasing potential for a mass purchase of the chargers themselves, if that's going to work out to be cost effective for the department. If not, we'll be charged individually purchasing them on each particular contract. I'd like to say we're right-sizing the plan. Uh, we are, have used the initial information that came from the Energy Commission on their corridor concepts. Uh, what, in the previous versions of the plan, what I, I call the electric vehicle cul-de-sacs. We were able to get people to a certain point on a particular route, but we, there was no charging ability past that for DC fast chargers. So we've corrected some of those, but I will show you on the map coming up that we did create a cul-de-sac on purpose, and uh, hopefully you'll agree with the reason we're doing that. The current plan modified the previous plan. Locations were added, some were deleted to make more sense, to make sure we had the right coverage and right distances, and that we had critical electrical systems system capacity in that area. In many of the locations, the costs are changing primarily because of electrical costs. Utility availability is turning out to be one of the more challenging areas of the program. And we, had, we did a comparison with the California Energy Commission on what it would cost for us to do the program versus them to do the program. And there really are some, some apples to oranges comparisons that makes it very difficult for us to determine true cost between the two agencies. As an example, when the Energy Commission puts out a proposal for grants for installation, they require the grantee to bring additional funding to the table for the project, but they don't count that as part of the project itself. So we can't really tell for each installation what additional funds 
questions came in from others to be able to do a true comparison to the department. In discussing with the commission's uh, CEC staff, they didn't think there was significant effort for us to be able to work together to transfer construction or management of the initial program to them instead of Caltrans doing it. So we are going to continue to move that forward. Uh, you'll see, we'll see, have a little bit of discussion on our project in the Central Coast in our District 5. It's very innovative. The district is going to be using a solar powered system. It's the first one, another first in the world invention. They're inventing a solar system for DC fast chargers that will be portable that we can move if needed, if usage needs to be changed. So how did we figure out where we were going with these things? Uh, governor's office asked us to look into where the uh, ownership of electric vehicles were to make sure we were covering those potential users of the system. So that was one of the, the uh, locations we did. The, uh, we also chose the um, Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development Reference Guide funding electric vehicle charging stations to help us figure out site-specific criteria, and those were primarily high visibility locations, existing parking available, and the right utility service was also available. Um, we will also be supporting electric vehicle access within the high priority carriers to get people between the ownership areas of the state. This, this is the map that the Energy Commission put out. The orange, the pink and the purple circles are the DC fast chargers that they will be installing by grant currently. The first one just started uh, uh, last week. The green locations are the department's proposed locations or where the gaps we will be filling. Primarily, it's a north-south coastal and inland uh, system. And then in, in Northern California, it gets you from the Bay Area towards the Lake Tahoe area and into Nevada. Southern California gets you get from Southern California, Los Angeles Basin to Nevada and the Las Vegas area. What you'll see is a little bit of a cul-de-sac. The green ones that are going up to nowhere is Route 395 on the uh, central part of the map towards the uh, right side, those three green circles. That's Route 395. About 62% of the auto traffic on 395 and District 9 is traffic going from the Los Angeles Basin to Mammoth. So these are recreational users that really have no ability to travel that route right now because there are no DC fast chargers in the area. So instead of have the plan that you saw in August, showed that route going all the way up to Tahoe, but because of the northern area, the lack of the right utilities in, in the locations, and state-owned facilities, we weren't able to continue that particular uh, corridor. But because most of the traffic goes from LA Basin to Mammoth, we thought it was a reasonable decision to stop that particular corridor at that location. So what you'll see in the report that you have w in front of you is this statewide map of all the corridors we're gonna be working on. Primarily, the route is on Route 5, north and south. So once the department's plan gets in place, there will be less range anxiety for uh, electric vehicle owners to go f north and south between border to border within the state. We've also in, uh, filled in gaps on Route 99 and on Route 101. At the very northern portion of the map, you'll see where you can get people now between the coastal route and the central valley route between Redding and Eureka. We had no ability to do that previously. And then in the uh, southern part of the state, this is where our, one of our cul-de-sacs where we can get people from the Los Angeles ba Basin through Barstow and Baker over to Las Vegas. Just across the state line, there are DC fast chargers that will fill the gap between the border and the city of Las Vegas. The uh, cul-de-sac I mentioned, the uh, Route 395 cul-de-sac is the red dashed lines. Uh, those will be get people from Southern California to the Mammoth Lakes area and hopefully back. So what we did is we tried to leverage the priority routes from the California Energy Commission. We also added connections between those at three locations throughout the state. So you don't have to just go north and south. You can also go east and west to connect to those routes to so give full mobility throughout the state. Once again, these are 37 locations, the initial installation plan for the department. We think this is going to be very effective in, in eliminating some of that range anxiety and building more um, confidence in the public that they can get from one point to the next. Uh, also throughout your map, this is just one example, throughout your uh, guide there is one, examples of each individual location by district. This is just a blow up map. What this shows you in the circles with the numbers are where we are putting our particular rest areas. On the statewide map, I'll go back one page, down at the bottom it shows you the location number and the facility that particular 
charging station is going to be located at. So this is just gives you a closer uh, look at those proposed locations and shows you the existing non-state owned DC fast chargers in the orange dots. So you can really see what the department is doing is we're filling in gaps that nobody else is looking at. We're not trying to supplant the public uh, or, the, or the private sector in doing this. We're trying to build more locations that aren't being done. The Energy Commission is not going to be building in these locations, so it really is a good partnership between the department and the Energy Commission to fill those particular gaps. So what are, what are we doing currently with the 3030 program? We've evaluated options to make sure that we have access to chargers, you know, locations that are, could be closed if an emergency. At the discussion on last Friday, there was a lot of concern that if we have these at rest areas, and we know the rest areas periodically go down or close because of various issues, primarily water quality or water availability, how can we make sure the public can, ha can have access to that charger? Working with our Division of Engineering Services and Maintenance Program we and these division architects, we can lock the, potentially lock the doors on the buildings themselves if it's safe for the public to be on site without having access to water. So therefore, the sites are available to the particular charger. We are using smart chargers so that those will note. You can log in to find out which systems are open and when they're being used so the public will know ahead of time before they get there if the charger is available. Now keep in mind, we are doing DC fast chargers. That doesn't mean there are slow there aren't other charging opportunities in the areas that the public could use in an emergency there are slower fast chargers phase one and phase two chargers that if ours are shut down someone can connect and get juice just take a little bit longer for their battery to build up so we, we they won't be stranded fully stranded in any of our locations if they're closed out okay so we are continuing to collaborate with CEC to determine if there really is any mechanism. It doesn't look like right now there's going to be a viable mechanism for them to do the construction for us by putting out a new grant program, which is what they would have to do. If they did put out an expedited grant program, it's questionable whether that could occur by November of next year for the governor's deadline. As I mentioned before, our support to capital ratio is improving, and the overall costs were going down well. We, we implemented a system of weekly teleconferences with the district project teams to make sure that everybody was sharing information so that we were um, doing things efficiently. What's happened is we, we saved a lot of time on uh, the cost to design and, and develop the projects because we put out standard plans, standard details, and, and we're putting out specifications so each district doesn't have to create their own. But what we're finding is the utility costs are our big bugaboo right now. Bringing in the right power, the higher level power in some of these very remote locations is not inexpensive. So that, that's while we're improving the support costs, we're, our capital costs are actually going up a little bit from originally presented to you last time, primarily because of utility issues. We are um, engaging the governor's office of business to try and help us work with the utilities to see if there's some way we can reduce those costs. Uh, but at this point, it looks like that's going to be the primary change in the increase in cost. We do expect to meet the November date uh, for 34 of the projects, beating the 30 minimum required for the department. And we do have some um, amendments that are coming up to you shortly that Bruce will be talking about. So overall, I think we, we tried to cover the, the questions you brought up in the last two meetings or the last two sessions on the ZEV program. And I think we, we've answered them to the degree that we think we have a program now that fully makes sense. It complies with what the Energy Commission is trying to accomplish and the direction from the governor's office. We are continuing to lower costs on each of the projects, but until the projects get into the actual PSE projects, plan specs, and estimate phase, we don't know the specific costs always. So they're generally coming down. We think they'll come down even further. So I want to give an example. We thought we were going to have to do full environmental documentation for many of the projects, all but two are CEs, category exemptions. So we are saving a lot of money on those um, expected costs there. The same kind of cost reductions are going to come, probably come in place when we get to design phase, when we see get to certain site conditions that we can fully understand that are just in general knowledge right now. So we see the project costs going down, the capital, Support costs have already come down. I think we've right-sized the program that we've presented to you in the past. So that's all the information I've had. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you have project-specific questions, we have fact sheets on each of those, too. Any questions? Thank you, Keith. Appreciate the hard work you've been doing. Um, a question. So we on the rest areas by federal law, we can't charge anybody. But on the other ones, are we going to charge? And my question on that goes to, 
can anybody use their credit card or do I have to be a member of a certain, you know, like I see different um, opportunities for charging stations. So will those that are going to be, will, will charge, uh, will they be open to everyone or just to a portion of our customers? Yes, we, we plan to charge at the non-rest area locations and we do not plan to have it a subscription service like a Tesla charging system. Everybody could, in theory, have access to it, yes. Mr. Frazier. Thank you. Um, so we're looking at this um, directive by the governor's office. Uh, you're going forward without knowing exactly what it's going to cost. Did you have a budget in mind before you started this process? Yeah. I hope I didn't leave that impression that we don't know how much it's going to cost. We do have an estimate for the program. It's around $23 million capital and support. About sometimes between nine and 10 million of that is support costs right now. Um, our budget initially was based on unknowns because we hadn't done these kind of projects before. So we, the, the department based the original estimates on similar size projects being very conservative, knowing that we didn't want to have to come back and ask for additional funds on the project. So we were very conservative in the initial estimates. As I mentioned before, the price of the costs are coming down, except that's been being negated right now by the utility costs. So what pot, pot of money is going to be paying for this um, program? Thank you for bringing that up because I forgot to mention it. We've been trying to leverage additional funding sources for the program. SHOP is going to be paying for the majority of it. But we have, are looking for grant opportunities. We've gotten about $1.26 million, $1 million in grants right now, and the districts are continuing to search for local grants for each individual project, primarily through the air quality control districts. So you're saying that the supplemental transportation funding bill that we did, now that the shop is invigorated, you're going to take money that I intended to use for maintenance in the California State Highways and the asset management program to fund this ZEV program. You're going to take away from that. The funding is expected to come from the shop, yes, except for the grant funding that we have found, identified. Plus a million dollars of free juice over five years. That's, that's the estimate, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I do have a problem with this program. Um, it's not what I intended of the shop after working two, two years, four months, and six days to get Prop 1B approved and signed by the legislature. I think this is something that needs to be looked at at the legis legislative level if this wants to, and wants to, the legislature wants it to go forward um, because they are the funding mechanism uh, in the budget um, and ultimately going to the governor. Uh, so I, I think that we weren't told that this kind of usage would happen. Um, at least I didn't tell my colleagues that. I told them that we'd be doing infrastructure and maintenance on our California state highways and not supplementing um, the ZEV program. I think if that was clear in the bill, I think that that would have been an appropriate usage, but we didn't tell them that. And I think that this commission needs to rethink um, how that money is appropriated uh, going forward because $23 million does a lot of pavement. And we are so far behind um, right now as it, as it is that I think that we need to rethink this. Uh, food for thought. Assembly, I could address that we as commission staff and commission raised those very same issues with the department, but there was budget language put into the last budget that actually authorized the use of shop funds for, for this ZEF effort. So that was an afterthought. Yes. During the final hours, it was slip, probably slipped in, but the legislature as a whole did not approve this. Um, if that's the case, I can see an implementation of, of this process, but I don't want Caltrans doing this job. I, I would rather have it privatized and, uh, and, and utilities or AB8 funding uh, the intended purpose of infrastructure for, for uh, zero emission vehicles and, and, and whatnot. That was the purpose of AB8. And uh, the California Energy Commission has been slow in getting it out, hydrogen and all of these others. But I don't want an agency that I consider um, my transportation experts in maintenance to be utilized in other areas. And so, um, like I said, I think that um, maybe I've got to do legislation to change that. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's something that I think that's, needs to be considered. 
Promises made, promises kept. And we promised that we would fix the roads. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I just want to reiterate the, uh, the direction from the governor's office for us, was for us to supplant the Energy Commission's plan and their priority corridors. Our locations are typically very remote where there aren't other opportunities. In the, that's why the rest areas were chosen. And the Energy Commission worked with us to do that. So there's that part component. The other component is by federal requirements, we cannot commercialize. So if the only location is a rest area that we have available to us, we cannot commercialize that particular subot. And I understand that. Okay. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is the intended purpose what we sold to the, the legislature and all my co colleagues that I talked to over the two years, four months, and six days that it took to get this bill passed wasn't to supplement this program, okay? And so I, I get slipping language in in the last minute to supplement these things. It happens all the time. But I don't want this agency to be the purveyor of, of, uh, of these charging stations. And, and having to worry about the maintenance and the vandalism and uh, coming out of your shop $200,000 a year for free electricity for cars. Right. Um, we're already highly subsidizing the purchase of these and now we're incentivizing um, you know, and this also. And I think it needs to be rethought. And uh, you know, like I say, that's an opportunity I have. I understand the governor's direction or the governor's office direction. Um, but there wasn't a there wasn't a dialogue with even me as the chairman of the transportation committee. So I think we need to just look at privatiz privatization, criminalization, uh, criminalization. Uh, <laughs> it was criminal. Uh, but I will say that you know the commercial commercial value that it, it has. We need the utilities to be step up and make sure that they're the ones driving this. And and again, if we're putting charging stations in, we're not offsetting any kind of energy usage, it takes carbon to, to create the, uh, the electricity. And so, you know, we, I think we really do need to th rethink this and, and get you guys back to what um, you do well. You know, this is all new to you guys and, you, and, and hats off for trying. I really, I really do appreciate that. But uh, I don't want you guys to be the jack of all trades and master of none. I want you to do what you excel at. So it's just food for thought. Okay. Any additional questions for us on this Comment, program? if I can. Uh, I appreciate uh, the assembly members' remarks, and we, we actually brought up uh, many of those issues in the earlier discussions. What I see in front of me today is vastly improved from the two previous hearings. And um, uh, it is uh, still uh, you know, a project that your assignment is to fill in gaps uh, that are the least likely to be um, the targets of uh, private investment. They're in uh, difficult spots. Uh, they're, uh, you know, in between destinations rather than nearby. There are uh, numerous companies that are building chargers in all over California. In addition to Tesla, we saw them in the on the orange dots dots on the statewide map. But there's some places where they're not going to go for all the issues that we're talking about. They're remote. It may be hard to um, service. Uh, electricity is going to be more expensive. So uh, you, you've been given, you know, a real work pill, and you have, uh, I think, improved the whole program in the intervening months and weeks. So I appreciate everybody's work on it because I know a, a lot of people in Caltrans who really had to dig in. Um, I'm glad uh, you looked at uh, better locations. You're um, going to be um, continuously monitoring costs. I'm glad they're coming down. They need to come down more. Uh, you can hear the concern in um, uh, the assembly member's voice about uh, you know w what this is adding up to over time. On the other hand, the electric car market is growing. We want it to grow more. Um, I mentioned my drive uh, earlier today. I drove up from San Diego. There was not a speck of snow on any of the mountains the entire way. I mean, we, I, you know, I think we need to do more uh, to clean the air and to reduce uh, the climate changes. So um, this is one way of doing that. A uh, couple of other little quick comments. Um, Envision in uh, San Diego does a solar portable fast charger, I think, so you're probably aware of that. Yes. Um, I do think there's an, <clears throat> an element here of a learning experience, but we've got to learn. <laughs> 
This is new stuff. And California is an enormous state. Uh, so uh, we, we really have to get out there and prove that we are going to have a system of chargers that drivers can rely on. Um, I'd like you to think a little bit more about cul-de-sac versus destination, because I don't see all these places as being kind of dead ends. Sometimes that's where you want to go. Um, and I hope, uh, I hope you'll look at that. Uh, one of the bare spots in the program is I-8 in, from East San Diego County to the Arizona border. Um, there's no chargers proposed in your plan because that was not a priority corridor that you were given. That's correct. I'd like to have uh, you relook at that, the CEC relook at that, and, uh, and the governor's office and, and see if we can look at what's going to happen to a driver between El Cajon and Yuma, and that includes uh, all of Imperial County. So I think there's an opportunity for more collaboration there and more investment. And I'm wondering, Mr. Chairman, if uh, maybe working with um, Susan Branson, uh, we could send a letter to uh, the CEC to look at that uh, part of the I-8 again. Uh, Mr. Medefra and I, I think, would, could sign on to it, and maybe others will too. So we have a sort of an official direction to look at that uncovered area in the in the state. I'm thinking that might be a little premature right now. I mean, this guy's going to have to come back and and fine tune what they have, and now we're going to ask them to go in a different direction. So are you guys done with your designs and all this other stuff? You're just barely starting out. We, we have not completed. We're just starting some designs. We have not gotten authority yet. You're going to get some requests shortly to ask us to go into those next phases. So I think maybe if we just communicated it. Yeah. And then I'd like to go back up the pipeline to the CEC and say, look at this right. corridor again. Uh, but that's what I'm saying is, is what, and Brian's not here, so why don't we talk before we jump in the middle of this and start redesigning the program, make sure that the governor's office, where this is coming from, okay. and the legislature uh, are on the same page. Staff recommends. And then, staff recommends. yeah, and then we see what staff comes back with, and, and then we go from there, because we can, we may be getting in the middle of something right. that we don't want to be in the middle of. <laughs> can I see my friend down there shaking his head? Yes. Yeah, so, you know. Mr. Chair, if you could put up the slide that showed the state Sorry. where we would see the, yeah, right there. So, no, the go purple, back. The purple dots. The dots. Oh, sorry. That's all right. So, you know, I don't know, Mr. Chair, if I necessarily agree with, I would like to see the commission look at this map, and there's a hole on this map. It looks like there's dots on every corridor with the exception of Interstate 8 East to the Arizona border. And I think that is a complete disenfranchisement of some very uh, needy communities. Uh, we look at the social justice issues of uh, vehicle charging. And if we're trying to incentivize the greater adoption of zero emission vehicles, then this is a chicken and an egg situation, and this commission should be able to make a statement to the governor, to the CEC, to Caltrans, and whoever will listen, that that hole needs to be filled. And I think that's what uh, we're talking about here. Uh, and I, I, I totally understand uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chair Frazier's comments. Uh, you had the same reaction that I went off on several meetings ago. Uh, in my Italian spirit, and uh, it, it is an improvement, it is a lot of money, but if we're going to be spending this kind of money, I want to make sure that a portion of the state is not disenfranchised, and looking at this map, it's pretty apparent there's one area that is, and we're, we're talking uh, quite an opportunity here to be able to expand uh, the potential of uh, adopting greater zero emission vehicles along the I-8 corridor to the uh, California border. Right, and that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm pretty sure we can get an answer from from the, the different- Well, if there's a motion to approve we're, this, we're, I would want to in second, include in the on. motion the idea that hang we would ask for that. Second. Okay, it, we can just bring this back next month. It's not gonna take us forever, but 
He's you know, rather than put us in a compromising position, sort of amendments we'll just back. bring it back. We'll bring it back next month, and then maybe we write a letter next month. And this is an information item uh, as it stands. So let's just chill. chill. <laughs> and we'll bring it back next month. Well, I'm pretty chill. It's just that okay. this thing is just going to keep you. coming back and back and back. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Did you have a question, Paul? Oh, okay. <laughs> item 50 is yep. an action item. <laughs> yes, commissioners. Item 50 is an action item. Up to now, on the ZEF program, you have only programmed the environmental phases and some of the right-of-way phases. Item 50 is a request to program for five of the ZEF projects, the, the rest of the design and uh, right-of-way and capital portions and capital support portions for five ZEF project for five of the ZEF no, projects out of the 37. Staff recommends that you approve this, uh, this uh, programming action. Motion by Madaf or second by uh, Tavaloni. Question? Uh, Stephen, I just had a question for you on the write-up, and I don't remember if it was uh, the previous item or this one, where some of the numbers didn't flow in terms of clearly identifying that, the that's total. On the, that's on the previous item, and the department has clarified that it's 37 locations. Okay, can we get our write-up to match? Yes, they will be, be corrected they'll to be match so that we're they'll be clear making, about yes. what exactly we approve. Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Item 51. Yes, commissioners. Item 51 is also an action on, on the ZEF program. This is the actual allocation of uh, design dollars and right-of-way support dollars for three ZEF projects. Staff recommends that you approve this allocation. Motion by Medaffer, second by Kehoe. Questions? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, we're just gonna go ahead and, uh, and wrap it up for today. Um, a couple things. I'd like to say thank you to the cameraman. I mean, we, we, I have a note here today. Uh, we've been, uh, you guys do a great job. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who won't be here tomorrow, have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I don't know if she's gonna be here tomorrow, but I'd like to adjourn the meeting uh, in honor of Janet Dawson. Yeah. So we'll see everybody tomorrow morning.